the Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. Dr. Emily Casanova earned her doctorate in anatomy science and neurobiology from the University of Louisville's Medical School. She's currently a postdoctoral fellow with the University of South Carolina's School of Medicine at Greenville, working in close conjunction with the Greenville Health Systems Departments of Psychology and Developmental Behavioral Pediatrics in the Department of Pediatrics. She has a research background in neurobiology, developmental biology, and some genetics, dermatology, and neuropathology, with particular focus on neurodevelopmental conditions such as autism and connective tissue disorders, like Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, hypermobility spectrum disorders. Her current research topics of interest include functional classification of high-risk autism genes, the characterization of genomic features common to autism risk genes and those genes' roles in the evolution of animal morphology, and etiological overlap between autism and EDSHSD. In addition to her interests, she is passionate about patient advocacy. She blogs at Science Over a Cuppa. These webinars are made possible through generous donor support, including a grant from Local 25 Boston Teamsters. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website at autism.com. All right. Um, well, thank you everyone for uh, attending and anyone who will be uh, listening to this on, uh, on YouTube in future. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and related hypermobility spectrum disorders in families with autism and how that may uh, relate to autism in general. So um, I'm going to give a little bit of background on the Ehlers-Danlos Syndromes um, and, and what those actually are. Um, as an overview, they tend to involve joint hypermobility, uh, skin elasticity, as you can see in one of the images above with, with classic EDS, um, as well as uh, varying degrees of tissue fragility. Um, it may affect the internal organs like the uterus or the bladder, et cetera, um, and, and it typically involves some uh, element of musculoskeletal pain and instability, um, sometimes uh, to the point of having uh, major dislocations that may even necessitate uh, various surgeries to correct. Um, ED the uh, different forms of EDS also have many um, secondary features, uh, such as immune disorders and dysautonomias, et cetera, that we'll, we'll talk more about later in the presentation. Um, just to the, to the left here, you can see just kind of a smattering of some of the different issues that arise in the different forms of EDS that, that it can be just a, a common chronic, um, common chronic problems um, in these uh, different conditions. So there are currently 13 different recognized types of EDS. Um, many of them are associated with some kind of collagen mutation or collagen pathway related mutation, um, such as uh, different genes that uh, may bind to the, to the different uh, collagen fibers and help to regulate their, um, uh, uh, their functions. Um, most of the types of EDS are extremely rare. Um, however, the most uh, common type, hypermobile EDS, makes up probably about 80% of um, of the EDS population, um, and and unfortunately, at least as of now, right now, there are no known mutations that are associated with this most common type. Um, that may hopefully change in future. As right now, there's a big push uh, to do uh, genetic sequencing in hypermobile EDS. So we'll see uh, what what comes from that over the next few years. Um, classic EDS uh, also makes makes up about another. You know, roughly 20% of, of the EDS population, and the rest of the forms of EDS are extremely rare. Um, if you look at EDS as a whole, the, uh, uh, the prevalence probably ranges uh, between one and 10 individuals per 5,000. Um, that may be a little bit more, a little less, um, and that also doesn't right now count the other forms of hypermobile spectrum disorders in the full joint hypermobility spectrum that we'll talk about. Um, and uh, so which those are um, undoubtedly much more common. Um, 
the estimates for EDS in some of these hypermobile spectrum disorders are also probably a lot higher in certain clinical populations. So for, as for instance, with our topic today, um, they're probably more common in autism. Um, so, um, and we'll, we'll talk more about that. So what is the joint hypermobility spectrum? Um, individuals on the joint hypermobility spectrum have varying degrees of hypermobility. Uh, that hypermobility may be localized to specific joints or it may be generalized and affect many joints throughout the body. Um, uh, individuals will also have varying levels of impairment. Some people may be relatively asymptomatic um, and that can definitely vary by age. Usually um, that, that likelihood decreases with age and uh, uh, individuals with joint hypermobility tend to have some problems over time. Um, that can also range up to very severe musculoskeletal impairment and these individuals um, uh, may have uh, dislocations and, and subluxations, uh, the latter which are a um, uh, kind of a more minor form of dislocation where the joint temporarily dislocates but then slips back in um, and usually doesn't necessitate any kind of uh, surgery or other types of intervention uh, to correct. And as I said, um, this can really vary over a lifetime. Um, and it can also vary day by day. Um, uh, EDS and the hypermobile spectrum disorders are uh, some of those conditions where one day you can feel great and, and the next day uh, you're laid out on the couch and, and you, you can't move. So um, uh, there, there's um, uh, considerable variability across people and across time and, um, and even within an ind own individual's life. Um, so the hypermobile spectrum disorders um, are defined in part by having significant musculoskeletal impairment um, as opposed to some of the other types of joint hypermobility, um, which may be more symptomatic. Um, again, obviously those diagnoses can change over time. Um, an individual in their youth may have generalized joint hypermobility, but by uh, their 20s or 30s may be starting to experience some form of, uh, of physical impairment um, and that diagnosis would then change to a hypermobile spectrum disorder or uh, possibly even EDS if it's, if it's much more severe and they meet other criteria. Um, there are many um, within the um, research and especially the patient communities um, that feel that generalized hypermobile spectrum disorder, which is um, uh, generalized hypermobility, so hypermobility across multiple joints of the body um, with significant musculoskeletal impairment, uh, that this is essentially a subclinical form of hypermobile EDS. Um, that's not completely agreed upon a, across the scientific community, um, but uh, that, that may well change in future. Um, as, uh, as data uh, continues to come out um, on this, this hypermobility spectrum. So I want to give you a little bit of background um, in terms of collagens, since these are some of the um, major proteins that we're interested in um, underlying different forms of, of EDS. Um, and so there's something known as the fibrillar collagens that we're going to talk more about. Um, just as background, humans in humans we have 28 different types of collagen. Um, about seven of these are considered fibrillar, and here I've listed the Roman numerals of the different collagens that are considered fibrillar um, in structure. And if you'll take a look at the image down below, you'll see that here you have a precursor on the far left, you have a precursor collagen chain, um, which forms a tropical helix into a procollagen and then finally into a collagen molecule. Then you have multiple collagen molecules coming together to form a collagen fibril, and then multiple collagen fibrils finally coming together to form a collagen fiber. Um, and these collagen fibers um, make up the major structural components of the connective tissues of the body, um, which basically forms boundaries around and in between uh, the different tissues, um, the different organ systems. So collagen fibers in EDS. Um, now here are these images, what you're looking at. These are essentially um, biopsies of skin um, and scientists have taken a cross section of that skin uh, kind of from the top. They've taken these long collagen fibrils and just kind of cut them across and they've looked at them under uh, an electron microscope. 
And in the far upper left, you see there's a, a sample from uh, someone who doesn't have ehlers Danlos Syndrome, an unaffected person. And in the other four images, um, you can see different types of, of uh, skin samples from, uh, from different types of EDS. Uh, and up above, you have atherochalasia type. You have two different cases of that. And as you can see, even within the same type of EDS, you can have some considerable variability. Um, down below, you've got an example from classic EDS. Um, and down in the, the lower right, you have an example from classic like EDS. Um, and you can see the different um, uh, mutations, the different genes that are involved. So um, in the upper, uh, in the AEDS cases, collagen one is affected. In the classic EDS, collagen five. And in the classic like um, something called tenacin XB, um, which is a protein that acts kind of as a linker chain in between uh, collagen five proteins. And so you can see it, across these different cases, um, you can have variability in the shape of the collagen fibers. You can have variability in the size and also the density. And all of these ultimately um, can lead to very similar overlapping issues within the skin and the connective tissue. Um, so, uh, and even as I said, within these other, you know, within the same type of EDS, um, up above, you've got case one and case two of atherchalasia uh, type EDS. And you can see that there's considerable variation in uh, the density of these collagen fibers, although they're, in general, the, the sh overall shape of the collagen fibers is definitely affected. Um, but, but there's definitely individual variability. Uh, so there also seems to be, and this is very interesting, um, there are ultrastructural differences um, in the shape of collagen formation in the skin of unaffected family members with hypermobile EDS. So you don't just find it in hypermobile EDS itself, you find it in individuals in their families, up to usually about two thirds of individuals in these families who do not have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, at least diagnostically. But when you look at the skin, they have some of the same features that you see throughout EDS in general. Um, and that's very interesting because that suggests that there um, is definitely some kind of Ehlers-Danlos spectrum, at least within these families. Um, and it makes you uh, kind of question what truly is the definition of Ehlers-Danlos? Because if it's just not um, a collagen deformation, well, then what is it? Is there something else in addition? Is there another risk factor? Is there something else on top um, that ultimately leads to um, the full EDS? That, that we recognize as hypermobile EDS. So as probably you are very interested in uh, attending this, this lecture, um, how often does autism actually co-occur alongside Ehlers-Danlos? Well, unfortunately, we don't really know as yet. Um, my group and I know some other groups um, across the world are um, starting to try and look at this. Um, and uh, right now we're, we're um, uh, trying to get some funding uh, in order to address this. But um, I can say that there is a growing body of literature that suggests that there's significant overlap between the joint hypermobility spectrum and the autism spectrum. Um, we ourselves have done a few, uh, done a few small studies, um, non-clinical. These have primarily been survey studies, but we're, we're currently in the midst of a clinical study now and, and uh, hoping to start another one, um, looking at various issues associated, uh, associated medical issues in women with autism or individuals with autism and um, those with uh, some form of generalized joint hypermobility, whether that's full-blown Ehlers-Danlos or um, a hypermobility spectrum disorder. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the things that we've, we've found in some of these studies, uh, especially with, uh, in terms of secondary um, medical issues. So um, in some of these studies, one of the interesting things that we weren't really expecting to find um, in which um, uh, we're, we're needing to follow up and really test and see if this is indeed the case, um, we've seen that mothers with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or hypermobile spectrum disorder um, seem to be reporting uh, a higher rates of, of autistic kids. Um, and interestingly, when we looked at them compared to uh, mothers who themselves had autism, um, the, the rates of having autistic kids did, did not seem to vary between those two. So that really suggests 
that Ehlers-Danlos syndrome hypermobility spectrum disorders may be um, a significant hereditary factor uh, for autism. Um, and we also found, although the numbers were unfortunately quite uh, quite low in some of the rare conditions, given that they are, are indeed rare, um, so far it, we're not really seeing a difference in the rates of autism uh, reported um, in the children by uh, EDS mothers. Uh, depending on the type of, uh, of EDS diagnosis. So we saw similar rates with individuals who had the older diagnosis, uh, the, the joint hypermobility syndrome diagnosis um, that, that is no longer in use, um, uh, as well as individuals with hypermobile EDS, classic EDS, et cetera. Um, all of them uh, seem to be reporting higher rates of autistic children. Again, please take that with a grain of salt. We really need to follow this up with clinical studies um, as there's always potential for bias in survey studies. Um, when we looked at the EDS mothers who had autistic children versus EDS mothers who didn't, um, one of the really interesting things that we found was that the EDS moms with autistic kids reported having more immune problems than mothers without, um, which suggests that the maternal immune system could well be playing a role in that hereditary risk, um, as, as uh, uh, certainly the immune system in autism is a hot topic, um, as well as the maternal immune system. Um, perhaps more surprising, we found, we found the same thing with moms, with EDS moms who had EDS kids. Um, they themselves reported more immune symptoms than EDS moms who didn't have EDS kids. Um, once again, uh, this suggests that EDS may be occurring on a spectrum and that there are probably other factors such as the immune system that may be playing an important role in determining its etiology. Uh, so uh, I just want to say once again, um, these are survey studies and we need to follow this up with, uh, with clinical data, but, but uh, it's some interesting possibilities. So EDS, autism, and the maternal immune system. <clears throat> As I said, there's been a lot of um, interest in um, maternal, something called maternal immune activation in uh, autism risk. Um, and maternal immune activation simply means that the mom has experienced some kind of infection or inflammatory reaction during pregnancy. Um, and that is potentially playing a role in uh, fetal development. Uh, we do know that there are important changes to gene expression in the brains of fetuses when they are exposed to a maternal infection. Um, and these tend to be protective mechanisms for the brains. However, unfortunately, they also have the potential uh, to disrupt normal development of the brain uh, because the brain is, is a very tightly orchestrated organ and uh, different populations of cells are born at different periods of time um, in, in rapid succession. And uh, many of them must travel long distances in order to even make it to where they're supposed to go in the brain. So all of these processes have the potential to be disrupted when the fetus is exposed to uh, some kind of inflammation. Now, when we looked at um, uh, one of these larger survey studies, when we looked at Ehlers-Danlos versus individuals with autism versus uh, unaffected individuals, people who didn't have either EDS or, or autism, um, we did find that there were significant group differences um, in, uh, in terms of, of the immune symptoms that were reported. Um, as you can see on this chart, too, uh, clearly there are sex differences. So even within, for instance, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, females with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome report far more immune symptoms than their counterpart males. Uh, and the same can be said of autism and control females. Um, so this is a, this is a general trend um, uh, by sex um, as well as clinical group. Um, another one of the uh, interesting things that we found is that, um, particularly within the Ehlers-Danlos group, uh, there tended to be um, uh, high reports of adverse reactions to vaccination. I know this is a touchy, uh, touchy uh, subject uh, for many, um, but 
given the overlap between Ehlers-Danlos and the syndrome uh, mast cell activation uh, syndrome that I'll talk about a little bit later, um, uh, we, we already know that, that um, individuals with EDS kind of have a, an itchy trigger finger when it comes to the immune system. So, um, so it, indeed, uh, prob about approximately 30% of these individuals reported having uh, some serious adverse reactions to vaccination, uh, necessitating caution um, uh, with future vaccinations. Um, I should also point out, however, that there are, are many who report um, serious reactions to contracting what we call a wild type illness, which is basically an infection from the community. So, um, you know, there are certainly individuals who, for instance, may have a serious reaction to the influenza vaccine, uh, whereas there are others with the same condition who have a very severe reaction to contracting the flu itself. So it's not something where we can simply say, oh, well, this group of patients simply should not receive vaccination. It really is on a case by case basis. And this is something that um, you know, that, that uh, um, patients need to work closely with, with their doctors and hopefully get a good doctor who knows how to listen. Um, in this same group, we also found that uh, folks with EDS were definitely reporting higher um, rates of mild immunological deficiency. So, for instance, there were a number of individuals who said, yeah, I, I contracted chicken pox like five, six, seven times before I finally became immune. Or, um, or I was vaccinated, um, but I never developed antibodies to this vaccination. Or I was vaccinated, but I needed additional boosters more than usual before I was finally uh, fully inoculated. So um, the immune system is definitely um, a cause for concern in this group, um, uh, this broad group of individuals, um, and uh, uh, and needs to be discussed uh, carefully with uh, with uh, uh, their medical team. Um, so I talked about a little bit about mast cell activation, um, and for those uh, who aren't familiar with it. Uh, some of the symptoms that uh, are, can be indicative of mast cell activation include things like anaphylaxis or, or skin reactions and swelling and respiratory distress and um, GI distress like uh, di diarrhea, uh, nausea, etc. Um, mast cell activation syndrome occurs frequently alongside uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Um, and uh, is, is starting to be recognized slowly as well in, uh, in, within the autism population, um, although there's not as much literature out there uh, on that crossover. Um, but just to talk a little bit about mast cell activation, mast cells are um, cells within your innate immune system, which is the very old, old branch of the immune system. Um, and this is your first rung of protection against some kind of invading pathogen. Um, and mast cells, uh, if you've ever had an allergic reaction, uh, you know mast cells. They release a ton of histamine in a local area or even a, a generalized area. Um, and this can affect all sorts of organs uh, and tissue systems within the body. It can target the central nervous system and the cardiovascular and respiratory and skin. It can even, it can even target the reproductive system. So um, these are um, uh, highly necessary cells, but when they themselves have an itchy trigger finger, that can lead to a lot of problems. And uh, individuals with very severe forms of, of mast cell activation syndrome can, uh, can be quite impaired uh, to the point of not even being able to go outside. Um, so um, uh, it can be a very, very, uh, uh, very bad syndrome to, uh, uh, to be affected by. Um, so I want to um, kind of change gears a little bit, although we're still talking about the immune system here. And I want to kind of take some le lessons from Marfan syndrome, which is another connective tissue disorder um, that, that is primarily underlain by mutations in a fibrillin gene, which is another type of, of protein that's involved in the connective tissue of the body. So um, there is a protein known as TGF-beta, and it's a, a major growth-related protein. It's involved in early development throughout, um, but it also is an important regulator of activity of the immune system. 
So one of the important things that fibrillin does is it basically acts as a storage unit for TGF-beta because, of course, um, TGF-beta, as I said, is involved in growth and development. It's also involved in repair. So when you have, for instance, a cut to your skin, you don't want to have to wait the time it takes for your cells to actually express the TGF-beta gene and produce that because that can take over a half hour before that would be ready. You need something immediate. So the connective tissue and fibrillin in particular acts like a storage unit for TGF-beta and for other molecules that your body needs rapidly. So um, while collagen is not as well studied in this way, it's quite likely that it also can act as some sort of storage unit um, and that in general, the connective tissue has this function. So you can probably imagine, uh, given that, for instance, TGF-beta plays a, a really vital role in uh, regulating the immune system, um, how the immune system might be affected in a condition where your storage unit is essentially not working very well. Um, and, and you can also see some of these issues in the related connective tissue disorder known as uh, Lois Dietz syndrome, um, that they tend to have uh, mutations in the TGF-beta pathway, and they tend to have a lot of immune-related issues. So, um, there are, so we talked a lot about the fibrillar collagens. Um, and as I said, these are structural collagens. They have a lot of functional um, uh, uh, purposes within the body um, that unfortunately are not very well studied right now, um, but we're slowly getting there. But there are also non-fibrillar collagens. So these um, are not making up the primary components of these collagen fibers. They may be involved with the collagen fibers, however, acting as linking and binding chains, but um, for the most part, um, uh, they're, they're, they're not a primary component of these collagen fibers. Um, one of the interesting things that um, actually a individual with uh, Bethlehem myopathy um, uh, told me about quite recently um, is that some of these non-fibrillar collagens can actually act like antibiotics. Um, we have, there's a, a domain within uh, some of these non-fibrillar non collagens called the von Willebrand factor type A domain. You don't need to know what that is, except that it's a structural domain within a part of these proteins um, that essentially has antibacterial properties. And so when you expose, for instance, and you, you can see in this picture over to the right here, um, you have two different types of bacteria, and up above you have them, that's how they look at, at zero minutes, of exposure and they look okay, normal bacteria, um, then they're exposed to collagen-6, in, uh, in, for instance, in this study. And you can see at 30 minutes, um, the, the purple areas are, are some of the uh, parts of the bacteria that are starting to deform and they're starting to have some problems. They're blebbing, they're, they're, they're becoming malformed. Um, and then you can see extreme versions at 60 minutes and finally 120 minutes. Um, so this is essentially collagen-6 acting as a, a, an act antibacterial agent. Um, so I thought this was fascinating because I had no idea that non-fibrillar collagens had this capacity, and it just makes you wonder, with so little that we know about connective tissue and collagens in general, what else are they doing to regulate the immune system or even act as part of the immune system themselves? Um, certainly in this case, some of these collagens, collagen 6 and 22, et cetera, um, you know, they're, they're clearly part of the immune system in this way. So that's fascinating. I think over, over uh, in future years, we're going to learn a lot more about what collagens actually do in the body. So in some of these earlier studies, we also looked at hormone symptoms. Um, in folks with Ehlers-Danlos and, and uh, autism. And uh, similar to the immune sim symptoms, uh, we found that females um, uh, in EDS uh, definitely report having more hormonal symptoms. Um, autism, as with before, kind of falls in the middle, and then the controls report the fewest number. And examples include um, hirsutism, which is, is male patterned hair growth that occurs in a female, um, it can in, uh, include um, heavy and prolonged periods, really painful periods, endometriosis, which is often related to very painful periods, 
um, and, and things like polycystic ovarian syndrome. So these were definitely reported more frequently in EDS, um, also more frequently in autism versus controls as well. Um, and finally, kind of the last big category of symptoms that we looked at were autonomic symptoms in, in EDS and autism. Um, these can include, uh, for those who aren't familiar with the autonomic nervous system, um, the, some of the symptoms that can be associated include dizziness and vertigo and fainting or near fainting, uh, chronic fatigue, uh, different types of headaches, gastrointestinal problems, shortness of breath, which may or may not be mistaken as asthma, uh, especially if it's medication resistant asthma. Um, and, and in general, we find, as with our other areas, uh, other symptom areas that we've looked at in terms of immune and endocrine or the hormones, um, uh, individuals with EDS also report a lot of autonomic symptoms. Um, and those with autism report more than controls. Um, and as you can see in the chart here, once again, uh, this is um, very susceptible to sex. Um, so the females across the board uh, report more autonomic symptoms than males. I um, mean, that includes within controls. Um, so um, I'm gonna go into a little bit of background uh, what we're talking about um, when we're talking about autonomic symptoms, because I told you about what some of the symptoms are. Well, wh what, what does that mean? Um, what's causing them? So um, the autonomic nervous system is a branch of the peripheral nervous system. So the things that the, the part of the nervous system that exists outside of the spinal cord in the brain. So it's out in the body. Um, and the autonomic nervous system controls automated functions, things that are usually involved with various smooth muscle functions and glands and things like that stuff you don't have a whole lot of control over. Um, the autonomic nervous system then is, in turn is, is broken down into the symp sympathetic and the parasympathetic branches. You don't really need to know what those do, except that the, for the most part, the sympathetic branch is your fight and flight branch, and then uh, your parasympathetic branch is your rest and digest branch. So one winds you up and one calms you down. Um, there are some exceptions to that, but, but uh, those are kind of uh, the generalizations. Um, and the autonomic nervous system innervates um, all of these different organs and tissues within the body. So it can affect your heart, how your heart functions, um, your heart rhythm, it can affect your breathing, it can affect your gastrointestinal tract and the rate of digestion. And um, I mean, it can, it can affect all sorts of things. In, in, in essence, um, autonomic nervous system dysfunction can be one of the great mimics um, which uh, has um, led to, unfortunately, slow rates of diagnosis and recognition of this broad condition um, and, uh, and not a whole lot of treatment options, unfortunately. Um, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, um, otherwise known as POTS, is um, one major type of dysautonomia um, that is frequently associated with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is why I'm talking about it here. Um, so as I said before, you know, some of the symptoms that I mentioned, the dizziness, the um, uh, uh, fatigue, shortness of breath, etc., all of those can be associated with, uh, with POTS. And in general, these individuals are, um, they have orthostatic intolerance. Um, they they are, are uh, very sensitive to posture. So um, the worst posture usually for these individuals is if they are standing and they are standing still. Um, they tend to feel progressive relief of symptoms um, as they sit down and as they lay down. Um, uh, uh, so one of the things um, in Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and, and the, the main hypothesis um, as to why POTS occurs so frequently in Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is that the collagen that is within the vascular system, the cardiovascular system of the body, um, is also affected. And the, um, the veins, uh, the blood, the circulatory system within the legs um, uh, may actually be, shall we say, a little bit stretchy and is capable of holding more volume. Well, unfortunately, that means that blood tends to pool within the legs. Um, and the legs are one of your, um, our major component, actually, of your cardiovascular system. You might not think of it because it's not your heart, but, um, of course, when you take uh, long plane trips, 
Many times the doctors will recommend, well, hey, wear compression socks, get up and move every hour, that sort of thing. And that's because the muscles of your legs are basically squeezing um, squeezing your, your vasculature within your legs and helping to pump that blood back up so that your heart doesn't have to do as much work. So in these individuals, they can really get a lot of tachycardia, which is rapid heartbeat. And in part, that's their heart trying to accommodate um, uh, uh, the, the, um, the low blood volume um, uh, and trying to pump that back up. It, it essentially makes the heart work much harder. It's not quite as simple as that, and there's, um, there, are, there are undoubtedly other issues involved, but that, that is one major hypothesis um, with POTS and, and EDS. Um, and some of the ways to uh, treat it, unfortunately, there's no magic pill Usually, um, sometimes at most there may be a, a salt pill, um, which helps to maintain blood volume. Um, they, they also recommend that uh, individuals drink a lot of fluids, really to be very uh, mindful of your posture and not overdo it. Don't stand for long periods of time. Um, maybe even some days don't sit in a particular position for long periods time of time without having your feet up. Um, uh, definitely eating smaller meals because, of course, uh, when you eat larger meals, all the blood kind of rushes to your your um, your your gastrointestinal organs, um, and that can um, uh, that can exacerbate uh, the dysautonomia. Um, and then also be cautious with caffeine. Um, although some individuals also may use caffeine as part of their treatment, it really varies. Um, but uh, the the autonomic nervous system in these individuals can be very sensitive, so um, it pays to be overly aware of um, of potentially, shall we say, neuroactive agents um, that can affect that system very easily. So um, given that we're talking about Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and the overlap with autism, what about, I guess the big question is, what about connective tissue in the brain? Um, unfortunately, we don't know a lot about the connective tissue in the brain and in brain development. Um, so um, I'll tell you a little bit about what we do know and um, in future areas of research. So um, we do know that, for instance, different forms of collagen, especially some of the, the fibrillar collagens like collagen 1 and collagen 5, um, they are expressed in the fetal brain. We don't know what they're doing, and we don't exactly know what regions of the brain they're expressed in. Um, here over on the upper left, you can see this is a this is a mouse embryo, um, and the the dark purple staining there is showing you where TNX uh, TNXB is, which is the um, uh, the gene associated with classic like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And you can see that it's it certainly looks like it's expressed um, throughout parts of the brain, um, although it's difficult to tell if it's superficial or if it's actually expressed deep within the brain. Um, it also looks like it's expressed through uh, what are known as the branchial arches, which are kind of the embryonic gills that um, end up forming part of the jaws and the ear. Um, it's definitely expressed within um, part of the developing ear. Um, and it's also, uh, it, at least in the mouse, it looks like it's also expressed in the developing limbs and the, and the end of the tail. Um, we, can also, we also know from um, uh, studies uh, on brain organoids, um, which are uh, essentially taking a biopsy from someone and developing neural stem cells and then um, developing these, these brain-like uh, structures um, on, on different, uh, um, different uh, um, often they'll use, actually they'll use collagen sometimes um, to try and form these, these brain-like structures as kind of a matrix. Um, but uh, um, we know that collagen 5, um, which is associated with uh, classic EDS, um, is uh, expressed um, in kind of these meninges of the brain, which are the outer layers of the brain, the kind of the connective tissue part of the brain. Um, and um, and we, we also know that um, the meninges play an important role in brain development. Um, although, once again, they're, they're terribly understudied um, because they are a connective tissue. It's generally been assumed that they kind of act as a casing rather than something that's actually functional. 
So you can see up uh, here to the uh, to the left, um, you have a, a cross section where uh, the little peach area, that's the upper part of the brain, and then um, the green here is the what's known as the pia matter, and then you have the arachnoid space and the dura matter. And those three main three layers are, are what is known as the meninges of the brain. Um, and uh, over to the right, down, uh, down here where you see uh, the arachnoid and the pia matter, um, in the lower part of the image, um, the little blue circles are collagen. So we know that um, collagen is definitely expressed in some of the lower layers of the, of the meninges of the brain. Um, meninges during early brain development are an help to maintain the stem cell pool within the developing brain. Um, so down in the, the lower right, um, these long bluish cell-like creatures here, those are um, neural stem cells um, that underlie the developing cortex of the brain. And so they are connected down to the basement, which uh, uh, the basement of the developing brain, which is just above the ventricles that, that contain all the cerebral spinal fluid. And they have these long projections that project, project all the way up to the bottom of the meninges. And, um, and when scientists have cut these connections, they've found that these neural stem cells effectively lose their neural stem cellness. Um, and you end up depleting the stem cell pool very early on. Uh, they also have found that when you, uh, um, when you cut those connections to the meningeal layer, um, that um, newborn neurons that would normally use that long stalk, as you can see here, these little red guys, um, they would normally use that long stalk of the neural stem cell to climb up and to uh, migrate into the developing cortex because um, all of these cells, unfortunately, have to, have to make their way um, to their final resting places. They're, they're not just born into the, into the uh, area that they're supposed to uh, uh, live in for the rest of their lives, essentially. So um, we know that this connection to the meninges is very important. Um, what are the meninges doing? Is it simply just an anchor? Um, what kind of molecules might the meninges be releasing that tells these cells keep proliferating, keep generating? Um, it does, do, does it also tell the cells what direction they're facing? Because that's really important. Cells need to know if they're going to migrate. They need to know what direction they're going in. Um, so, and, and the, the brain and all of these different tissue types of the body, they, they release these soluble um, uh, molecules into the surrounding area and that dock onto cells. And so cells can tell when they um, when they receive these molecules, oh, I'm facing in such and such direction. So they know I need to keep moving in that direction. Um, but one thing we don't know is what roles are these collagens playing in the meninges and are they affecting this process somehow? Are they, are they vital to, um, to brain development? And if so, how? Um, so that's something that we just don't quite know yet, and um, but uh, um, uh, hopefully we will be going in that direction. Um, we we also know that some of the non-fibrillar collagens are expressed within the brain tissue, so not just out at the meninges, but they're expressed within the actual gray matter. And um, as you can see here, there's um, um, collagen 18. Uh, seems to be really important in the development of inhibitory synapses in a structure known as the hippocampus, which is uh, vital for memory formation in the brain. Um, so on the, the right-hand side, you can see in green, these are all these little inhibitory synapses. And then over on the left-hand side, uh, you can see a similar picture, but this is from a mutant mouse uh, who has a mutation in collagen 18. And you can see that these inhibitory synapses have not formed. Um, so again, what, what, um, what are these non-fibrillar collagens doing, uh, within the brain? Um, uh, that's still very early. Um, we, we don't yet know. Um, so yeah, uh, that's, that's the major theme. We have a lot of possibilities. I think some of the, um, the new research, um, nowadays realizing that connective tissue is not just something structural, but it's something that um, is involved um, in actual 
function and actual development of the body um, is a really important realization. And uh, I think scientists are going to continue to try and study these aspects of both fibrillar and, and non-fibrillar components of the, the collagen system. Um, one of the things that we're um, uh, working on doing right now is we've partnered with um, with the Max Planck Institute over in Dresden, Germany, with uh, Dr. Wieland Huttner, who has done a number of studies um, uh, uh, on brain organoids and looking at folding patterns and development of these brain organoids um, uh, derived from different patient populations. So he's very interested in um, in looking at Ehlers-Danlos because obviously connective tissue is is a major impairment in this group of syndromes. So um, one of the things that we're doing, and this is very early, is we're um, looking for just a handful of patients um, who have uh, some of the more rare forms. We're, we're hoping if we find something that we'll be able to expand to hypermobile EDS and the hypermobility spectrum. Um, but right now we're having to kind of play it, unfortunately, play it a little bit safe. Um, we do have a few patients with vascular EDS, and we're still looking for some folks um, with classic EDS who have um, uh, who have uh, um, uh, classic EDS associated mutations confirmed. Um, ideally, also if if any of you have a MRI, brain MRIs, that would be even better too. Um, but if you're um, interested in donating a skin biopsy, um, we can totally try and work with you. Um, you can contact me. I've got my email uh, down in the lower lower right. Um, or if you want to uh, try and find some of my other uh, contact information, I have it listed on my my blog, uh, as you can see below, Science Over a Cuppa. Um, and uh, we also address a few of these issues in our upcoming book, um, which is being released next month, Defining Autism. Um, we do talk a little bit about EDS, but not as much as I would like. Uh, it's still early, but that's uh, definitely for future books. I'm looking forward to that. Um, uh, but definitely we talk a lot about the immune system in autism. So I think, again, there's some uh, relevant issues um, in, uh, that the EDS community might also be interested in. Um, and uh, so that's, that's about it. Uh, thank you, everybody, for, um, uh, for listening, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. The first one okay. here is about diagnosing EDS. So getting assessments, mm -hmm. especially if you have a loved one, who is also on the autism spectrum, we're asking about how right. it's diagnosed and who diagnoses it. Mm -hmm. And then also if there are mm -hmm. any specific sort of clues that you might look for in a person with autism. Most typically, um, and, and certainly I'm, I'm a little bit of a novice to this, and there are many patient communities um, out there on the internet, and they are an incredible wealth of information. I have, I have learned so much. Um, the, uh, the trend that I've seen the most, um, is to get a referral to a geneticist. Um, and, um, sometimes a rheumatologist will diagnose, although that's, um, sometimes that can be a frustrating experience. So I've, I've tended to just recognize, um, recommend that people try a geneticist, um, someone who is familiar with the different, uh, EDS, uh, different forms of EDS, um, that's probably your best bet to get a referral um, to a clinic. Um, and they may or may not do some genetic testing. Uh, the most, as I said, the most common form is hypermobile EDS. And right now we don't know of any mutations that are associated with it. So um, the likelihood that genetics would come up with something is, is not that great. Um, but if you feel like doing it, it's, it's, it's always worth a shot. Um, some of the things to look for obviously is to confirm that if there is a generalized hypermobility according to the Baton scales, um, and you can look those up online, uh, that's Baton, B-E-I-G-H-T-O-N, um, and, uh, and there are some videos on that as well. Um, there can be some variability uh, in terms of whether somebody agrees that, uh, that someone makes cutoff or not. Sometimes it's a little bit subjective, I've noticed. Um, but, uh, and it'll also definitely vary by age. Uh, younger kids are much more likely to have hypermobility, but they may end up growing out of that. That's not to say that that might not lead to some um, musculoskeletal impairment down the line, uh, just because it appears that the hypermobility has gone away. But um, that's certainly the, one of the major criteria that's used, at least as a cutoff for the joint 
for joint hypermobility spectrum. Um, and then if there's any uh, pain associated um, with the hypermobility, um, definitely you want to get that checked out, um, you know, because that, that can be impairing. Uh, the hypermobility is usually not quite so bad. It's the pain and it's the instability and, and the, the chronic uh, injury to those joints. That's the biggest issues. Um, so that, that, those are my best recommendations. Although if you want more detail, um, please feel free to email me and I can um, uh, um, uh, pass you on to some more knowledgeable individuals and also uh, link you to some great groups online where you can just ask as many questions to your heart's content. Okay, great. So it sounds like right now because of the sort of the state of the research, online connecting oh. is sort of a key aspect of health. Oh, it's vital. It's really vital. They, they, know, they know way more than most doctors, um, without a doubt. Okay. So you talked quite a bit about vulnerability to infection. You touched on POTS. Um, I got a couple mm -hmm. of questions about PANDAS and PANS. So do you have mm -hmm. any insight mm -hmm. about the connection between those two syndromes and, and some of the right. PDS? Right. Um, we don't have anything concrete right now. Um, I will say that I'm very interested in PANDAS and PANS and um, regressive forms of autism in relation to these syndromes and the overlap with um, the immune severity. Um, that's, a, that's a big concern in these families. So um, we do talk about it a little bit in the book. We do have a whole uh, section, a whole chapter on regression um, in autism which, um, and the immune system, um, which is uh, certainly uh, applicable to certain aspects of PANS and PANDAS. Um, but, uh, um, but it's still early, but I, I foresee that becoming a, a, um, an, a broader area of research, um, because I think there's definitely something there. That's just, that's just my educated guess right now as researcher working with a lot of this stuff and listening to these communities and, and working in both, you know, having a foot in both EDS and autism. But, um, I, I, I think we are going to see some, some links. So, yeah. Okay, this next question, they're asking, have immunomodulatory mm -hmm. therapies offered, have they offered any modifications of symptoms in EDS patients? It's unclear mm -hmm. if maternal immune activation is part of what's observed. Um, what's thought to be mm -hmm. that etiology? Right. Um, so, it, it does kind of vary by individual. A lot of people, uh, for instance, um, they're on pain medications. Um, those do tend to be immunomodulatory if you're um, talking about like NSAIDs. Um, because there's a lot of overlap with things like mast cell activation syndrome, a lot of these individuals are kind of on a, um, shall we say, an MCAS medication regime. Um, and that usually includes uh, like a combination of H1 and H2 antihistamines. Um, maybe some kind of um, leukotriene receptor antagonist. Um, um, uh, you get mast cell, um, uh, um, uh, mast cell targeted uh, medications, uh, mast cell stabilizers like uh, um, uh, chromalin and quercetin, which is over the counter. The latter one is. Um, so there's a lot of interest in that. I noticed there's a lot of individuals in that community who do use immunomodulatory uh, drugs, um, either prescription and over-the-counter, um, to regulate their symptoms. Um, it doesn't solve everything. It may take the edge off. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's definitely common. Um, and what was the other half of that question in terms of the maternal immune activation? He said it was unclear to him if MIA is part of what is observed in EDS, and he was asking what the thoughts might be to, right. if that's part of the etiology. Right. Um, I would not say that's the primary etiology. Um, I would say first and foremost, you're definitely looking at deficits to collagen or some kind of connective tissue. But if you're talking about something that forms a spectrum of severity, um, then maybe some kind of maternal immune activation could be playing a role in, um, in uh, uh, developing EDS. Now, do I think that necessarily the, the maternal immune system is targeting the development of the connective tissue? 
I don't know. Um, I do know that in general, the maternal immune system um, plays a big role in helping to um, basically orchestrate and teach the developing fetal immune system so that if the postnatal, so after birth, if the postnatal immune system is actually playing a role in the development of EDS, so is it making the difference, for instance, between somebody who has asymptomatic joint hypermobility versus somebody who ends up having um, major pain and impairment? Is the immune system potentially playing a role in that? I, I, that, that could be a possibility. That's, that's one thing I would be interested in studying further. Um, but uh, um, as far as specifics in the development of, of EDS, um, that's that's kind of as far as I've as I've looked into at the moment. Um, it's still pretty early, um, and uh, um, so I think we have I think we have probably a better idea of what maternal immune activation could actually be doing in helping to promote autism um, in the brain. Um, but um, in terms of helping to promote EDS, that's that's less clear. Um, but I do have a few ideas of where I'd like to go with that uh, and test. Okay, so. this person is asking about the utility of the S100B protein as a biomarker for severity of problems and mm -hmm. collagen issues. So do you, are you familiar with that at all? That, unfortunately, I'm not. Other than, other than uh, S100 staining in mouse brain, <laughs> unfortunately, um, which, which is a totally different issue. Um, but uh, again, if they want to email me and have a discussion, I am totally happy to, happy to learn and happy to help them brainstorm if they're interested in something like that. Um, I do have some other context too if they um, would like any recommendations. Okay, great, great. She was asking also just about how collagen would be related to vagal nerve dysfunction. So is there, do you have any familiar mm -hmm. or same answer for that? Right. Um, there is, um, so yeah, definitely the vagal nerve is a, is a big interest uh, when it comes to things like POTS and other forms of dysautonomias and, uh, and then in relation to Ehlers-Danlos. Um, how exactly it's causing dysfunction in the autonomic nervous system and the uh, other parts of the peripheral system like the vagal nerve, that is a big don't know at the moment, but there's a lot of possibilities. Um, for instance, uh, connective tissue is really important in helping to maintain and help to repair um, nerve connections in the peripheral system. So, um, you know, if you have, and of course, nerves in the peripheral system are, are, are somewhat plastic as well, which means you can have um, breakdown of connections and repair of connections and things like that. So. Um, you know, I would I would say that one possibility um, is that if you have a faulty collagen system, you're not repairing those nerves quite as well. You may end up developing some neuropathy. You may have some abnormal connectivity because of that. Um, then on top of it, you've got this major inflammatory response that is so frequent in EDS. Um, and what exactly are these inflammatory molecules doing to the nerves there? Um, are they damaging them? Um, and are they um, uh, preventing repair? Are they um, causing abnormal repair? Um, there's a lot of possibilities. Um, and then finally, um, you know, what, um, what roles are, um, more direct roles are, are collagen, collagens playing? Because there are some collagens that are actually um, involved in, um, for instance, in the neuromuscular junction. Uh, so the, the connections between nerves and muscles, um, and they, they form a structural component uh, to the neuromuscular junction. So if that's not working well, um, you know, then you can certainly have some misfiring. So um, I think there's a lot of possibilities because this is definitely a complex condition, um, especially as you have um, a lot of chronic damage and, um, and abnormal stimulation. Um, there's, a, there's a, a number of possibilities, and it may actually end up being very complex. There, all of these things could very well be playing a role, and it may vary across individuals. So, um, 
yeah, it, it's still a bit early, but I, I look forward to more studies being done on that topic because um, I think there's a number of avenues uh, that can be taken. So. Okay, great. Well, we are out of time. I appreciate your time today, Emily, and we still do have some questions. So you said it's okay if people want to email you? Oh, please, please. Um, my, my Gmail that's listed on my Science Over a Cup of blog is probably the best way to get in touch with me, um, just because university emails sometimes send things to spam. So, um, but, but feel free to, to email me and try me on both sites. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm also on some uh, number of EDS groups on Facebook and, you know, so there's a number of ways to, to get in touch with me. Um, I'm always happy to open up a discussion.